Section 33 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3. Chaldean Civilization, Part 6. The constitution of the family was of a complex character. It would appear that the people of each city were divided into clans, all of whose members claimed to be descended from a common ancestor, who had flourished at a more or less remote period. The members of each clan were by no means all in the same social position, some having gone down in the world, others having raised themselves, and amongst them we find many different callings, from agricultural laborers to scribes, and from merchants to artisans. No mutual tie existed among the majority of these members except the remembrance of their common origin, perhaps also a common religion, and eventual rights of succession or claims upon what belonged to each one individually. The branches which had become gradually separated from the parent stock, and which taken altogether formed the clan, possessed each, on the contrary, a very strict organization. It is possible that, at the outset, the woman occupied the more important position, but at an early date the man became the head of the family, and around him were ranged the wives, children, servants, and slaves, all of whom had their various duties and privileges. He offered the household worship to the gods of his race, in accordance with special rites which had come down to him from his father. He made at the tombs of his ancestors, at such times as were customary, the offerings and prayers which assured their repose in the other world, and his powers were as extensive in civil as in religious matters. He had absolute authority over all the members of his household, and anything undertaken by them without his consent was held invalid in the eyes of the law. His sons could not marry unless he had duly authorized them to do so. For this purpose he appeared before the magistrate with the future couple, and the projected union could not be held as an actual marriage, until he had affixed his seal or made his nail-mark on the contract tablet. It amounted, in fact, to a formal deed of sale, and the parents of the girl parted with her only in exchange for a proportionate gift from the bridegroom. One girl would be valued at a silver shekel by weight, while another was worth a mina, another much less. The handing over of the price was accompanied with a solemn solemnity. When the young man possessed no property, as yet, of his own, his family advanced him the sum needed for the purchase. On her side, the maiden did not enter upon her new life empty-handed. Her father, or in the case of his death, the head of the family at the time being, provided her with a dowry suited to her social position, which was often augmented considerably by presents from her grandmother, aunts, and cousins. The dowry would consist of a carefully marked-out field of corn, a grove of date-palms, a house in the town, a trousseau, furniture, slaves, or ready money, of which there would be three copies at least, two being given by the scribe to the contracting parties, while the third would be deposited in the hands of the magistrate. When the bride and bridegroom both belonged to the same class, or were possessed of equal fortunes, the relatives of the woman could extract an oath from the man that he would abstain from taking a second wife during her lifetime. A special article of the marriage agreement permitted the woman to go free, should the husband break his faith, and bound him to pay an indemnity as a compensation for the insult he had offered her. This engagement on the part of the man, however, did not affect his relations with his female servants. In Chaldea, as in Egypt, and indeed in the whole of the ancient world, they were always completely at the mercy of their purchaser and the permission to treat them as he would had become so much of a custom that the begetting of children by their master was desired rather than otherwise. The complaints of the despised slave, who had not been taken into her master's favor, formed one of the themes of popular poetry at a very early period. When the contract tablet was finally sealed, one of the witnesses, who was required to be a free man, joined the hands of the young couple. Nothing then remained to be done but to invite the blessing of the gods, and to end the day by a feast, which would unite both families and their guests. The evil spirits, however, always in quest of an easy prey, were liable to find their way into the nuptial chamber, favored by the confusion inseparable from all household rejoicing. Prudence demanded that their attempts should be frustrated, and that the newly married couple should be protected from their attacks. The companions of the bridegroom took possession of him, and hand to hand and foot to foot, formed, as it were, a rampart round him with their bodies, and carried him off solemnly to his expectant bride. He then again repeated the words which he had said in the morning, I am the son of a prince, 
gold and silver shall fill thy bosom. Thou, even thou, shalt be my wife. I myself will be thy husband. And he continued, As the fruits borne by an orchard, so great shall be the abundance which I shall pour out upon this woman. The priest then called down upon him benedictions from on high. Therefore, O ye gods, all that is bad and all that is not good in this man, drive it far from him and give him strength. As for thee, O man, exhibit thy manhood, that this woman may be thy wife. Thou, O woman, give that which makes thy womanhood, that this man may be thy husband. On the following morning a thanksgiving sacrifice celebrated the completion of the marriage, and by purifying the new household drove from it the host of evil spirits. The woman, once bound, could only escape from the sovereign power of her husband by death or divorce but divorce for her was rather a trial to which she submitted than a right of which she could freely make use. Her husband could repudiate her at will without any complicated ceremonies. It was enough for him to say, Thou art not my wife, and to restore to her a sum of money equaling in value the dowry he had received from her. He then sent her back to her father, with a letter informing him of the dissolution of the conjugal tie. But if in a moment of weariness or anger she hurled the fatal formula at him, Thou art not my husband, her fate was sealed. She was thrown into the river and drowned. The adulteress was also punished with death, but with death by the sword, and when the use of iron became widespread, the blade was to be of that metal. Another ancient custom only spared the criminal to devote her to a life of infamy. The outraged husband stripped her of her fleecy garments, giving her merely the loincloth in its place, which left her half naked, and then turned her out of the house into the street, where she was at the mercy of the first passer-by. Women of noble or wealthy families found in their fortune a certain protection from the abuse of marital authority. The property which they brought with them by their marriage contract remained at their own disposal. They had the entire management of it. They farmed it out. They sold it. They spent the income from it as they liked, without interference from any one. The man enjoyed the comforts which it procured, but he could not touch it, and his hold upon it was so slight that his creditors could not lay their hands on it. If by his own act he divorced his wife, he not only lost all benefit from her property, but he was obliged to make her an allowance or to pay her an indemnity. At his death the widow succeeded to these, without prejudice to what she was entitled by her marriage contract or the will of the deceased. The woman with a dowry, therefore, became more or less emancipated by virtue of her money. As her departure deprived the household of as much as, and sometimes more than, she had brought into it, every care was taken that she should have no cause to retire from it, and that no pretext should be given to her parents for her recall to her old home. Her wealth thus obtained for her the consideration and fair treatment which the law had, at the outset, denied to her. When, however, the wife was poor, she had to bear without complaint the whole burden of her inferior position. Her parents had no other resource than to ask the highest possible price for her, according to the rank in which they lived, or in virtue of the personal qualities she was supposed to possess, and this amount, paid into their hands when they delivered her over to the husband, formed, if not an actual dowry for her, at least a provision for her in case of repudiation or widowhood. She was not, however, any less the slave of her husband, a privileged slave, it is true, and one whom he could not sell like his other slaves but of whom he could easily rid himself when her first youth was past, or when she ceased to please him. End of section 33. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.